Yes, we are live. My name is Dr. Shornell Wolverton, and I am with Swiftfire True TV, meaning TV that tells the truth. Go figure. Uh, so excited because this has been a work in progress. This interview is very, very important to me. Um, those of you who are familiar with the Ann Hamilton, you know her work and you have followed and you've seen her amazing resources that have helped so many of us. And I, I found her book, actually her one of the first book I ever found of hers is God's Poetry. And it talks about the names of God, the names of that, that are given to us and how even um, they mean something specific and how we live that out and how when you get married, things can change. I mean, it was like it was science. It's the science of names, basically. And I was just so hooked. And uh, I contacted her straight away to get her on with my show. And I think that was two years ago. Was yep, it over two years ago? <laughs> yeah. So uh, we are finally, you know, we have been hit or miss with time changes and family situations and all of the things, but we are here today and tonight, and we are going to talk about not only names, but the study of words, which is a love of mine. Conscious language is amazing and very helpful in our time. And, uh, and we're going to talk about God's poetry. And so just how God writes and how uh, God can give us these amazing um, paths through a name that's spoken over us. Um, just recently, I got this new book about covenants and code and God's pageantry and thresholds. And uh, we're going to dig in a little bit. I haven't got to read this yet, but I'm going to ask a lot of questions. And um, I also would like to, um, I'm going to put all the links for these books so you guys can find them all and my favorite name book because everyone who knows me knows that I am like very nitpicky about the specifics of names and always have been because I understand the science behind that. And before I even had this amazing book to back up all the science of that. And so, um, and for those of you um, who, you know, maybe they're in this audience and they're not familiar with their work or, or your background, can you just give a little, background about who you are, how you got here, what you're doing, and, you know, let people come into your world a little bit about what you're all yeah. about. Yeah. Um, I, I originally started, I'm an Australian. Um, you'd be able to tell by my accent. Um, it's uh, the next day here and uh, it's a beautiful morning. And uh, um, my background is that I am a mathematics teacher oh. and that might seem like a, a really strange place to come from. But um, what I really felt that I would love to do in my life was to write children's fantasy. And so I, I did, right? And, and it was a long journey to getting published. But what I found along the way is that I couldn't write a story unless I had the right name for the character. And I thought that was just me. But I've discovered that, in fact, there are a lot of authors like that. And for me, it would it would take months. I would go through name books and I'd be searching for that perfect name for the character. And when I found it, I just know it. This is the one, right? And so I, I had that sense of you've got to have the right name, right? And I didn't actually translate this across to people. I just thought this is just me and how I how I write and um, how I want to write. And it seems to be the key element in what I want to do with these particular books. Now, as it turned out, one of the things that, that happened along the way after I wrote my first book was um, and in retrospect, it's really important. At the time, it meant nothing. Uh, I was I was just finishing up the last draft of my first children's fantasy, which is called Merlin's Wood. And my sister rang me and she asked me about a dream she'd had. And the dream was about an ancient spirit 
coming to her house and picking something up. And she asked me, so what did he pick up? And I said, well, you know, come on, describe it to me. And she couldn't. She had no idea how big it was, what it looked like, what shape it was, what color it was, nothing at all about it. So I said to her, look, I'll ask God what that was, but don't expect the answer very quickly. You know, in fact, you know, don't expect it inside five minutes, let alone five weeks, five years. Anyway, I got off the phone and the first thing that I thought of was, oh, wait a minute, I've got a title for my next book, right? Ah, oh, it's just popped into my brain. So I'm writing this title down and I'm sort of making quick notes and I said to him, wait, I need to ask God about what um, that was in the dream but I also need to ask him more importantly that if he answers me five years in the future, I will remember that I asked him and I will know that this is the answer and I'll be able to thank him for it because otherwise I'll just forget. So um, five years in the future, I was actually able to look back on that moment and go, you know, God gave me the answer in five seconds. He actually gave me the answer within the title to the book. So this actually sort of started to feed my interest in names and what was going on. And more than that, I was actually able to just start to look into the Hebrew idea of names. And so looking at the Hebrew idea of names was basically, this is about destiny. This is about identity. You know, there's all sorts of ideas out there about what identity is, you know, how it can be tied to your sexuality or to your gender or to your job or to everything else. And, you know, the answer is just so simple. It's your name. And one of the things that I realized uh, when I started to look at the Hebrew idea of a name was that, well, what about today? What about us? Is this true for us as well as for the people in the Bible. And I came to the conclusion that A, it had to be, but B, I couldn't see how it worked out. I started to look at books of names and going, how does this work for people? And I quickly realized that books of names actually kind of distill down to this very narrow definition what a name is. But within the Hebrew idea of the name, it is poetry. And in fact, the name of the book that you have there, God's Poetry, is actually about um, Ephesians 2.10, right? And Ephesians 2.10 is um, we are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works. And that word masterpiece, um, and some central translations, handiwork, um, and some translations, um, what's the other one? Oh, I've forgotten, but never mind. Um, that whole translation comes from the word poetry. We are God's poetry. And once you start to realize that we are God's poetry, you realize that names are not necessarily about uh, that nice, neat little definition. And once I started to research names, I realized that the nice, neat little definitions for a lot of people have been sanitized over the centuries. So that, you know, we've got this nice, lovely idea when, in fact, so many names go back to mythic characters and to the gods of the nations. And our names are basically, in many cases, dedicated dedications to other gods. And what I started to realize is that my whole thing about fantasy writing was had come from a love of fantasy and I'd realized that I had that sense that as I read C.S. Lewis um, that there was something more here. I, I used to do a camp, a kid's camp, um, every year and it was called Camp Narnia. And 
the kids would come along to this camp. And one of our activities was every morning we dramatize the, the story. So someone would, one of the leaders would read the story and the kids would act it out. Now, although we had the book in front of us and it looked like we were reading, in fact, it was the Reader's Digest version where different sentences were highlighted and you'd actually sort of move through paragraphs very quickly. So it was a very quick read. But the kids would go, no, the next line is this. And you go, how many times have you read this book that you know the next line? And it happened so often and I, I just wanted, to, I went, so what is it about this book that kids love so much to bits that they're actually rereading it over and over again? Because it's not as well written as a lot of other books. It's not a story that is as cohesive as so many other stories what is it about the story that makes kids love it so much that they actually know the next line and what i started to realize was you know lewis was really key for me because when i started to look at what lewis's name was it immediately became obvious that the answer to my question of how does this work for us today was there he was one person who'd done it, and he'd done it through his books. Now, if you know the stories, you'll know that what they feature through every single different adventure is the great lion, Aslan. And that's the key to the whole thing, because Lewis means the lion. And it comes from uh, the name of a Celtic god, Lulor Giffey's the Lion of the Steady Hand, who was the God of Light. Wow. And so you can see that what Lewis is doing is actually going, no, 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 sorry. Dedication to my name, i got to sort it out. I have to sort out that it's the Lion of Judah. Wow. It is not this Celtic God of Light. And so through his stories, and I started to read other people, uh, one of the pe pe people that I read uh, without knowing who she was, I had no idea. I'd come to this conclusion. I really wanted to know what the name, uh, what, the, what, the, um, what the word Sula meant, S-U-L-A. So I, I looked it up. And of course, if you um, look it up and you have no idea, um, way back then, uh, this is very beginning of Google, all I could find was uh, Toni Morrison's book, Sulla. Now, I had no idea who Toni Morrison was, but this was the answer to another question that I had for God. And my question was this, what's more important? Your family background, your bloodline, or your name? Wow. Well. Right, and so I'm I'm getting these uh, I'm getting these books of Toni Morrison's, and I don't know who she is. All I know is, as I'm reading these stories, I am finding images that are unique, and names that are unique, not to her, but to Clan Morrison of the island of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides. And as I'm thinking about this, I'm going, oh, well, that's really interesting. You know, why are these stories about Afro-American people? And I, I gradually realized that Toni Morrison was indeed a very famous author and she was Afro-American. And then I did a bit more digging and found that Morrison wasn't even her birth name. It was, in fact, her ex-husband's name. Wow. And within the story, all of the symbolism while it seems to be Afro-American, was in fact linked to the Morrison's of the So I came to this conclusion that this was God's answer to me, that it was names were more important, and even the names that we took on, the names that we were known by were most important of all. So regardless of 
what your actual name is. Every single name you've ever been known by is really important, but the most important are the ones that we're known by every day. Mm -hmm. And what I further realized in all of these years, you know, it's been a long time now, is that a name is a prophecy. And most of the time, your parents get it right. And that kind of was the most amazing thing, like, wow, parents, I don't believe that parents could be that in tune with the Holy Spirit that they would get it right that often. So I had to conclude after a while that, in fact, God is actually saying, okay, that'll work. You know, the name that you have given your child, they can make that work. And he gives it a big tick. But it becomes a prophecy, not just of your destiny, but also in many cases, what the family issue is. So many, many people are named for what the issue, the unresolved issue of their bloodline is. Wow. And you can see this happening all through scripture. You can see it, you know, the big one is Jacob. Mm -hmm. What kind of parent names their kid deceiver? But when you look at the issue that's coming down the bloodline, Abraham is a man of immense faith, absolutely staggering faith, except when it comes to taking his wife to a foreign country. And then it all collapses, and he deceives the local ruler about who she is. He tells, you know, whoever it is, that uh, Sarah is his sister, not his wife. And he does this not once but twice. He gets a chance to redo a test, in my view. And as a consequence of having to redo this test and failing again, he passes that test down to Isaac, who fails it again and makes it even worse because Abraham was telling a half-truth. Um, Isaac is telling no truth at all. And despite the immense amount of faith, the unresolved issue was defeated. So you get this kid whose name is Jacob, the one who grasps the heel, and the whole idea is behind it is deceit. And so I believe that that's what parents generally do. They're, they're basically prophesying to their kids every single day, every time they use their name, you're going to be the one to solve this for our family. You're going to be the one that brings our family into its destiny. You have your own individual destiny, but your family has a destiny too, and you're going to be the one to solve this. So, you know, that that's probably way too much background for you, but that's <laughs> that's where it is. Well, yeah. I, I love what you're saying. I have like a ton of notes. Um, you know, the reason why I was drawn to you and your book or someone had told me about your book is because they know I obsessed over finding the perfect name too. Um, not just when I was pregnant, but even finding out what my own name was because and, and is because my name is so unique and growing up, um, I won't say I didn't like it or you know, uh, it's just, I could never find anything that had my name on it. You know, when you go, people buy like keychains or whatever, and most people have like something with their name on it and mine wasn't available and no one could tell me even what my name meant. So it took, it wasn't until my twenties that I actually went down the road of really digging into what my name, or at least what I found out what my name is. Um, and my mom was given my name in a dream before I was born and then she forgot it. And so for a while I didn't even have a name um, until she went to a couple of different um, baby showers and one was Michelle and one was, uh, I forget, but the combination was like, oh, Shornell, maybe it was Shannon and Michelle. And it was like, oh, that's it. And then she named me. And the whole story is, you know, that I was given my name. Well, um, one of the things that I, quote, struggled with, I guess, in Christianity was I didn't ever see myself as, you know, the the person who would go out and evangelize and try to 
do the prayer and get people to jump over and like push for that. And, but I love to teach. And when I started looking up what Sharna and, uh, and EL, EL meaning of God and Sharna actually means not only warrior, but Rose. And I started looking up the origin of the Rose of Sharon and how it's in the center of Israel. And it was this place where all these sheep would come and eat and they would, eat off of these wild roses uh i was like oh my god like this relief came over me because it was like i'm doing what i'm actually called to do is i'm a warrior and also um a rose but here i am providing resources for the sheep to teach and and this whole like false sense of responsibility like literally came off of me to just not have to do all these other things, but just, just to teach and to feed my sheep, like Jesus says. And, um, Bob Jones was uh, a mentor to me for years. And he always said that your first name is who you are. And your second name is what you're called to do. And my middle name is D which when I looked up means love. And I'm like, well, of course that would be my entire call is to, to love, which my shirt says love wins. And so, you know, there's all of these kind of little things. Um, but when I was pregnant for the first time with um, Shane, I just labored, you know, to have the perfect name because I knew how important it would be spoken over her over and over. And, and my second um, pregnancy we we actually my husband at the time had picked the name shiloh and when i looked it up in the book it actually meant precious sacrifice mm -hmm. and i immediately was like i don't want to do that i don't want to name anything that because to me it sounds like she won't even make it and um you know it was just very like frustrating for me and maybe it was a self-fulfilled prophecy i don't know what it is but we ended up miscarrying and um and when I was with Bob and I had been promised a son and I said to Bob, I said, was, do you think that it was the son? And he said, no, but she was a precious sacrifice. And he didn't know anything about the Shiloh thing. I had not told anybody. And I was just like, holy moly, like there is so much power in this, you know, whether it's just me giving it or a subconscious or something with the energy of it. And then even now my my grandson, my first grandson was just born. My daughter named him Cody Bennett, you know, while she was pregnant. And when she told me that Bennett's my grandfather's name and she, I said, Oh my gosh. I, when I found out she's pregnant and she, she gave me the name and the due date at the same time. And I was like, okay, well let's backtrack to see, well, when did you conceive? And we found out she conceived on my grandfather's birthday, 921. She named him Cody Bennett. Bennett was my grandfather is my grandfather's name. And he was born on 9-21-1921. The due date was the day he passed. And she had no knowledge of this. She's just like thinking she, you know, just being like, this is what I want to do. And of course, she's 21. Austin's 21. We're in 2021. And here's this baby born within days of when my grandfather had passed um, and a hundred years from when he was born, literally a hundred years. So, um, you know, I work in foster parenting with animals and I have named 92 kittens <laughs> with precise, you know, and, it, and uh, one of them I named Ash and it got really, really sick and didn't make it. And then it wasn't until I went to go pick it up at the vet and it's little urn that I was like, Oh my God, Ash, you know, so there's, I'm always looking for ways to upgrade my own choices and ways that are, you know, and I get like some things are just the way they are, but you mentioned even um, people being named after locations and how they take on things. Can you share yes. a little bit? Yes. Um, one of the um, ideas that the um, Romans had was that of what they called the genius loci, meaning the spirit of a place. Um, and what I, I realised in my own writing was that um, 
you know, I mentioned I mentioned Merlin's Wood. Now, I, I wrote the story, but I didn't have a title for it. And uh, when I finished the first draft, I looked at the book and I said, what's this about? I said to God, what's this about? Um, and mysteriously, it was 13 chapters and in the very first draft, they were all 13 pages long, which was not what? happened in the end. But I, I could look at that and go, hmm, something here. And so I said, God, what I would like to do, and this was my very early days of names, I, I would like to find out something about my own name. Could, could you know, just sort of help me on my second go through, just really help me understand what my own name's about. So I finished it. The whole thing was eventually about 13 trees. It doesn't have anything to do with Merlin. It has to do with Merlin's wood. And I thought, this is really weird what has happened with this. And it's definitely nothing to do with my own name. So, you know, well, God didn't answer that prayer. So, well, so what? But it's about something. You know, 13 trees. Like that 13 is really... And so I went looking for it. And eventually I found most of the imagery that was in the book in a very old Welsh poem called The Battle of the Trees. And I thought, that's weird. Like, why would I be writing about a Welsh poem? There's no Welsh at all in me. And time went by, maybe six months, something more than that, and my mum had asked me a question about the family, and I thought, hmm, I wonder if I can find what she's looking for. So I, I put the different things that she'd sort of seen as patterns in the family you know I put them um, in a search engine I don't think it was Google because I don't think it was back then and I looked at it and I went I put the name Hamilton in there and what it came up with was a word that was related to Hamilton this was the name that the Hamiltons had had before they were called Hamiltons All right so Basically, a lot of these people had had this name and they had turned it into Hamilton when the Duke of Hamilton had moved into the area. Let's call ourselves after him. Now, that particular name was a, a Scottish Gaelic word, Cadio, and it means, apparently, the Battle of the Trees. No way. And in addition, it refers to a part of the Caledonian Forest in the 6th century where Merlin lived, it was Merlin's Wood. No. It was the name of the place. And, and so this was a layer underneath my name, Hamilton, way back when. We weren't called Hamiltons, we were called Cadios. And so God had answered my prayer in the most amazing way. So now I start to look for people, the layers in people's names, right? And one of my prime examples for layering is Jerusalem. You know, it's the really obvious one, right? If you know anything about Jerusalem today, uh, basically it has a wall going through it, right? It is not the city of peace that the name proclaims, right? But its original name was Jebus from the Jebusites, right? And that is exactly the same word as Jabez, and, of course, there's the famous prayer of Jabez, right? Do not allow me to receive pain, cause pain. Don't allow me to be persecuted and expand my territory. And what Jabez is basically doing is saying, hey, um, my mum, um, no, like my name means pain, persecution and walled up. So, Lord, please don't allow the pain. Please don't allow the persecution and please expand my territory. Take down the walls. But when you look at Jerusalem today, you go, hey, that pain, the persecution and the walled up is absolutely perfect for what is there. And there's many other places, particularly locations within Israel, that actually have that same sort of layering. Right, and they affect our names in particular. Particular one of the the one that is particularly affected is Dan, because Dan means a judge, 
But by the time of Daniel, you've got the obvious association with a lion. And that's because the tribe of Dan moved out, took a new territory, named a city that used to be called Lion wow. Dan. And so there's this layering that occurs and it continues to today. You can see in people's lives the things that are happening for them are actually about their names. And once you start to actually seriously look for what a name means, then that actually is what is happening to people. But in addition to that, you have the whole thing of why did God give names? You know, go back to Genesis and you'll find that what God was saying to Adam is, hey, the very first thing I'm going to give you to steward, the very first thing I'm going to give you dominion of is names. That is of identities and destinies. Wow. And that's lost. That's lost to us, right? Because with the fall, Adam lost that as well as everything else. And as a consequence of that loss, where are we today? Well, basically, what God has given us is how do we restore it? He restores it through name covenant. Now, I found name covenant by um, reading uh, several books by a guy called Henry Clay Trumbull. Now, he was a Sunday school superintendent in the um, 19th century. And he was um, basically the, the head of the organization um, in the US in the late 19th century. And he wrote a series of books, one on blood covenant, one on salt covenant, one on threshold covenant. And he promised he was going to write a book on name covenant. And as far as I can work out, he never did that. So having read these other books, I went, I'm going to have a look at what he would have found back then. It's obviously possible to do it, right? So I started to look for the whole idea of what name covenant would be and name exchange. So, you know, they didn't call it covenant back then, obviously. What they did was they called it exchange, right? So we have today still remnants of the old name exchange, even in the West, right? And the remnants are when a woman takes on a man's surname at marriage, right? But until the about 100 years ago, almost exactly, there was an enormous number of name exchanges occurring around the world. And what that meant was that basically people would say, through this exchange of names, you and I are no longer individuals. We are one. And as a consequence of this name exchange, I'm obligated towards you. So, for instance, the explorers, particularly Lewis and Clark going across the States, um, Captain Cook going all the way through the Pacific, in various different places, people would actually do the name exchange for their own benefit, right? Now, that wouldn't be seen as a benefit on the part of um, the Indigenous people because that was what they were used to. They understood it, but the explorers going through, that's basically their entree into new territory. They're protected by the name exchange, mm -hmm. right? They would do it with a chieftain to make sure that, hey, we're, we're, you know, we're going to be fine here. Um, but when they did something that actually really violated that exchange, then that's when things start to go really wrong for them because the obligations were that you would protect each other, you would defend each other, you would, you know, all the whole deal. Right, especially with land and territory, like if this queen was married off to this king or this group of people and that group of people, they did the name thing together. So when they were out and about, they would know 
not only do I have this group with me back in me, but this group's back in me too. And it brought yeah. like a peace between the two places, but also yeah. kind of like, yeah, you're not just messing with me anymore. You got my yeah. name and everything behind it, which goes into the whole taking Christ consciousness or Christ and the covenant yeah. of, you know, um, awakening to Christ and, you know, people that put the full armor of God on and it's like, mm -hmm. That is a represent. That means you do everything that's representative of that, you know, energetically and in you. And covenant with Christ is the same exchange. It's like you have all the things that Christ is greater things than these. So, but anyway, that, any, that makes me excited. But go ahead. Yeah. So the the name covenant um, is basically, you know, there's there's dozens of them through Scripture. We only usually notice a couple of them. Um, the first one obviously is Abram becoming Abraham, but it's an exchange. And that's the thing that we don't usually realize because at, when you see what is happening there and you see the whole scene is God appears and he says, I'm El Shaddai, walk before me and be holy. So what God is doing is going, this is part of the exchange. I'm going to reveal to you a new name for me. And I'm going to tell you what I'm going to call you, right? And this is really important for us today because, mm -hmm. like I say, we've lost that whole thing through Adam. We lost the dominion of names. And Satan has had thousands of years to study what name means. You know, he knows the moment we're born, the moment we've given a, we've been given a name, what our destiny is going to be. He doesn't bother some people because they are nowhere near their destiny. They are not making choices that are about their destiny. They're making choices usually to actually go, I'd rather be wealthy than have, you know, what my destiny is. Lots of people are in that position. So basically they can be ignored. But when you make a choice which is obviously or possibly going to lead to your destiny, then Satan's got actually got to come in and stop you, right? And he knows what those choices are going to be because he knows what the name means. And the only way God can actually get around this for you is by giving you a new name. And so you get these very small poetic things you know, Abram to Abraham, mm. Sarah to Sarai, things like that. You get Gideon, right, to the, the name doesn't change, but the emphasis changes from the whole word to a fraction of the word, right, where instead of meaning axman or hewer, it becomes man of valor, which really means man of armies. And that's the first part of his name anyway. So there's just this different emphasis. And so what God does is basically go, okay, so how can we use the poetry of your name to get around every trap that Satan has laid for you? <laughs> well, and what you said about the emphasis of the syllables, and I mean, there is a science to this. What you say actually matters. And so the yeah. fact that a name is spoken over and over again or certain emphasis, um, like with Cyanetics, uh, I was studying and someone would just say, you know, take sand and put it over a speaker and they would mm -hmm. say the name turtle, turtle, turtle. And what mm -hmm. would come in the sand would shake up and it would make the perfect turtle like shell of like what a tortoise or a, a turtle would look like. And then they said zebra, zebra, zebra. And um, same thing the voice mattered into this zebra stripes in the sand. And I mean, Adam was creating or, you know, what, whoever came up with the names uh, was creating and we're creating as we speak. And even going back to covenant to say in Jesus name, the reason yeah. why is that's bringing in the fact like, this is who's, this is who's with me. This is the covenant yeah. that I have is I'm praying this or decreeing this in jesus name which by the way jesus has the highest scalar waves on the planet 
um, you cannot go higher than, I mean, we've tested a lot of different people. And so that's the highest frequency, love, you know, God. Yeah. And so when we, when we have that back up, you know, and we, and we say this in Jesus name, that is to covenant of saying, uh, look who's with me here. Like, look at, look yeah, at the DNA exactly. that I have that that's in my covenant. Yeah. 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 That's exactly what you're doing. You're calling on the covenant and you're actually saying, I'm, I'm calling on Jesus as my backup. All right. I can't do this in my own name. This is impossible, but I can do this in Jesus name. Well, and, and uh, I yeah. heard you guys all who are watching because we got quite a few viewers here. Please do share. I would love to not only have you guys share this so other people can be encouraged and maybe do some own some of their own investigating and research in their name for this season. It's really important. Um, but also, I'd love to hear where you're from because it looks like we got like Philippines and all over the United States and uh, lots of different people piping in from different places. And I just like to know where people are, um, where they're at, but, um, continue with what you were saying about, um, even taking on curses though, of locations, right? Didn't you mention something in one of the things I read? Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, people can take on the curse of the particular location. And, and, and my, my belief is that by taking on the name of a location, we've taken on the name of the dedication of a God. And as a consequence of that, what is meant is that some, you know, what the genie, what the, the Romans called the genius loci, the spirit of a place, it was, it was fixed in that location, but now we've given it the ability to walk. Yes. Because we have taken the name. And what I do is I did, I just go to people, look, you cannot possibly, you know, a lot of people will come to me and say, well, so what do I do about my name? Yeah, you know, And what does my name mean? You know, and I go, I have no idea. Because ultimately God wants to redeem your name and I don't know what he's going to do with the poetry of it. There are so many different directions poetry can go. Once you start to, you know, get into your mind that God likes etymology, but he much prefers poetry, then it's going to be the poetic thing that he can do with it to actually go, you know, this is going to change everything. And what he links in scripture, two things together, um, he links giving you a new name with a threshold covenant. So there's two covenants that come very closely together. And as far as I can tell in scripture, they're always six days apart. Hmm. And my understanding of what they're doing is it, it is like conception. It is basically, there's the moment of conception and then six days later, there is the moment of implantation. If you don't get something to implant, you know, Physically speaking, if you don't get the, the fertilized egg to implant within six days, it's going to naturally abort. And so I think for a lot of people, what's happened is that God's given them names, but something has intervened to actually cause their destiny to miscarry very early in the piece. But what God is doing by this threshold covenant is what he's actually saying is this is the defense mechanism. Right. You can see that Abram gets this. Sorry, I should have said Abraham because he's Abraham at that stage. He's been six days Abraham. And he gets it when these three people turn up. And originally, if you read Henry Clay Trumbull, this is the guy that I said, you know, back in the 19th century. This was an idea of hospitality. And it's all about hospitality rights. It's all about coming into covenant with each other, agreeing that we are going to defend each other to the death if anything goes wrong here. And I'm going to actually walk with you for some way when you leave tomorrow to make sure that you get safely on the way. So Abraham does exactly that. He walks with God for some way to make sure that God is going to be safely on the way. You know, 
God doesn't need that, of course, but that's what a good host would do. So there's all of these different things. And I got to the end of this book and I went, you know, this explains exactly all sorts of mysterious things that go on in scripture that I've never, ever thought about before. And, you know, they've baffled me, but you just sort of read over the bafflement. But I have a question. And my question was, this is all about hospitality going right. What happens when it goes wrong? Mm. And as you read through scripture, you realize that when it goes wrong, it is always catastrophe. Mm. Always. And, and what I realized is that over a long period of time, when we get these different covenants from God, and the idea of covenant, particularly in the last century or so, has been, okay, here's all of these covenants, bang, down to one. Nothing else, just one. We have one covenant with God, but in fact, that's not the case. There's at least five, there may be more, but you can see these different ones occurring through scripture and they have different aspects to them. They're all about coming into oneness with another person. Yes. But in different ways. So, you know, there's the oneness of the blood covenant. And that, to me, you know, is totally related to God saying to us, you're saved. This is salvation. And this is about coming to God's family. This is about being a son or a daughter. But not every son or daughter matures to the point where they become a friend of their parent. And But this is actually what God wants us to do. He wants us to mature to become his friend. And then he will go, I will give you these other two covenants, name, right, and threshold. And when he gives you these other two covenants, it's basically a whole new deal. And I believe that most people don't get them because of God's mercy. And by mercy, what I mean is this. You have to demonstrate yourself to be faithful. And if you are still persisting in sin and just saying to yourself, the grace of God covers this mm -hmm. and not actually going, hey, the grace of God covers this by making me empowered to overcome it, right, then God's basically going, you cannot have these covenants because they will destroy you. Because when you become my friend, now you can betray me. Mm. Only friends can betray. Enemies cannot betray. And wow. sons and daughters, basically, God's going, well, even if you do betray me, you're still my son and my daughter. But friends? Wow. And so you look all the way through Scripture and you go, those instant retaliations that you see, where God seems to be going, I'm going to slap you down so fast and you're going to die. <laughs> uh, not God's malice. It's God, you have agreed with me that we will be friends and you turned around and betrayed me. And you've taken my name and, and or done crazy name. stuff in my name. You know, and we've done crazy, yep. That's exactly right. And that cannot go on. You cannot do crazy stuff in my name and you cannot have my defense to do crazy stuff in my name. You're gone. And so, you know, once we understand that this not just happens in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, we see this happening with Ananias and Sapphira. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Right, and there's hints throughout that story through their names that this is what ha is happening. We basically have to go, okay, we have to actually get to a point where we understand that God is empowering us through His grace to overcome sin. And until we can actually show ourselves sufficiently faithful, and I don't mean perfect by that. By what, what I mean by perfect, oh, sorry, by not by perfect, uh, what I mean by faithful is we are committed to the relationship. 
And once we show ourselves committed to this relationship, God will give us this new name and he will give us this defense. And he will be saying to us, now you can come into this covenant agreement with me where you can get into your destiny and I will defend you against all sorts of things, you know, against Leviathan, against Python, against Jezebel, against Belial, against all of these different spirits who are threshold spirits. And what they want to do is make sure that we never, ever get into our destiny because that is such a huge threat to them. Well, and when you mention sin, to me, sin is anything that misses the mark. And yeah. so sin can look like a lot of different things. And sin doesn't have to be just the Ten Commandments. I mean, sin mm -hmm. could be if God said go to the grocery, you got an urgency to go to the grocery store and you felt like you needed to go at 10 o'clock, not going would be missing the mark. And, yeah, you know, missing the mark is love, uh, you know, missing love. And who is God, a person who is a spirit, who is a frequency, who is the covenant that we're in. And so listening to that intuition, that God positioning system, the GPS within, that's mm -hmm. what regulates what sin is. And I'm saying, you know, of course, we have basic guidelines. Don't kill, you know, don't yeah. you know, love everyone, you know, all that kind of stuff. But for, for the sake of, you know, just going the extra, when you get to the friend part, you're not yeah. talking about talking to a kindergartner and saying, you know, these are the basics, you know, don't run out in the street, you know, but, but then there's, it, it's like the seatbelt or the leash that the, I say the leash gets shorter, but also there's such a, a, a love and just, just such a, um, a joy in being in the realm of, of being in the right place at the right time. There's there, and there's a physiological uh, release that from, oh, that absolutely. Comes from the brain that gives you a backup to do what you're called to do because you are called to do it. So the, free, the physiology comes too. And when yeah. we're living true, we have the physiology when we are yeah. lying or out of covenant or less than love, then there's 1500 chemicals that saturate the cells that cause you to go weak, sick, you know, mm -hmm gain weight, go gray, you know, age, you know, all of that. So living true and holding up to the name that we represent is so important on so many levels. And you just brought that whole betrayal friend thing to another level for me that that was profound to say you can't um, betray an enemy doesn't betray, but a friend does. I mean, that is, wow. That's yeah. Yeah, and that I think is, you know, the whole thing with God because when you're in that space where, you know, you've you've got in, you started to get into your destiny. Okay, you've got the, in, your individual destiny. You've got your family destiny. You've got things that are unique to you that God wants you to do. But there's also things that are general that he wants you to do just because you're part of the human race. And the the general thing for everyone is that God wants you to heal the earth. Yes. And so, okay, those particularly for those of us who are named after places, it's about those places. Wow. It's about, you know, the sons of God. I, I love the J.B. Phillips version, you know, um, all creation waits on tiptoe to see the sons of God come into their own. Wow. And, and this is the this is the one about the earth groaning, waiting to see the sons of God be revealed. Because the earth knows that when we can get to that space here, we can do the healing. Right? It's not just about healing ourselves, it's about healing the land. And you know, one of the things that I really, really love about the stories of Jesus, and, and this is sort of the direction that most of my research is going at the moment is looking at the geographical locations where Jesus did his miracles and then looking back into the history of that place and going, you know, you've picked a unique person who perfectly represents the history of the land to heal him or her so that the land can be healed. Because it's clear that's exactly what he's doing. You know, one of the 
most extraordinary ones is uh, where he goes and he goes to Samaria, the woman of the well, right? Now, the very last thing that occurs chronologically speaking in the Old Testament, not talking about the um, layout of the Bible, the layout of the Bible, the last book is Malachi, but chronologically speaking in time, the last book is Nehemiah. Mm. In the very last bit of Nehemiah is we sent the women away. Wow. Right? Is basically we, um, he and Ezra basically decided that, you know, for racial pur purity, the men had to divorce their foreign wives and they, the wives and the children were sim simply set away. Right? And many people look at that story and they go, well, we know that Nehemiah was the man of the utmost integrity, so what he did must be right. But we don't look at the very subtle commentary that Jesus makes on this. And the subtle commentary is he's going to Samaria. He's sitting down by a well, right? And that well is at an immensely historical location. This is the place where... Abraham made his first altar when he came to the promised land. Wow. This is where Jacob not only built a well, but he buried his household idols. This is the place where Joshua, when he's at the end of his life, he's saying to the people, hey, here's this stone. And it's a witness against you that the covenant that you've just reaffirmed is you've got to keep it or this stone is going to witness against you right all of this is in the same location right this is the place where not very far away joseph's bones are buried everything about this place is about covenant and about covenant reaffirmation in fact the god of shechem was called baal Barith, god of the covenant this is the place where Everything was lost to the line of David. Rehoboam came here to be proclaimed king. He probably um, went there for the living water, right, because there were two things needed for kingship, you know, properly. The, the proper ceremony was the anointing oil, which you could get anywhere, but you also needed living water. So as soon as Jesus is mentioning living water to this woman, it's all about the restoration of the kingship to the line of David. And the only way that that can happen is if the Samaritans basically proclaim him the Messiah. So he's got this immense agenda about all of these covenant issues that have gone in, on, on in the place. And if you count the covenants, you find out there's five of them. So here's this five times married woman. Oh, my gosh. Wow. And there's another really dodgy covenant that's involved as well. And she's got a sixth really dodgy relationship. She is a perfect representative. She's a Samaritan, right? She's like one of these women that Nehemiah sent away. She's wow. just perfect. So many layers for this. Yeah. And so what he's doing is he's going, okay, Nehemiah, what was he? He was a cupbearer. What does the cupbearer do? It gives you drink. What's the first thing Jesus says? He says, give me a drink. Wow. So he's, what, what he's really saying is, be my cupbearer. So he's saying all of these immensely significant things to this woman right it's not just about her it's about the land and this is not just what he does for her this is just not unique to Shechem wow. it's everywhere and you can see that what he's doing is just this enormously healing thing in every place and sometimes you can you can tell from the name of the place what's happening and sometimes you can tell from the name of the people what's happening but we don't always have the name of the person. So it's, you know, sort of, I love the name of the person to be known. So you could sort of look deeper and see what else is going on there. Because so often 
what he's doing is so multi-layered and yeah. you just go and it's all done with this something a two-year-old can do will you give me a drink you know some of the miracles i just go no they're way above my faith level but can you give me a drink anyone can do that and so i think that you know god is saying whatever your destiny is some parts of it are going to be so easy all you have to do is be at the right time right person right place and that's a matter of you know as you say being so in tune with the holy spirit when you says go to the grocery store now you do because he's got an appointment and you may never even know what that appointment is all about you may come away going well i don't know why you sent me to the grocery store now but some interaction that you did that was so simple it just seems like ordinary every day is about a healing of the land and a healing of history because that's part of your destiny and part of the calling on your family and all that kind of stuff well and i can tell you for i mean just when i paid attention to those little urgents urgencies or pushes or you know that holy spirit my holy spirit the spirit the pneuma within um i mean over and over and over i i see why and what even though it seems so not significant at the time you know i just walked um i, I went to a certain store last week and the person wasn't there they had a note on the door saying you know they would be back but they didn't say when and they had a number to call and this whole thing happens and i really was supposed to be i thought supposed to be in my mind perception according to my list going just it was off schedule you know but i i heard you know stay and i waited and turns out this lady um who came back was going through major grief uh, not only a physical issue that i was able to help with as a doctor but also going through some emotional stuff it was the anniversary of her mom's death you know she was dealing with some things with her husband at the time and you know i was there to be able to talk through some things and found out the next day that she followed what i said and she went and stayed with a friend and the friend went over and uh he decided to go to rehab which he had not done you know any time of talking before and the next day i i I didn't know he was going to be there, but I went back to go get something and they were both there and I was able to speak into both of their lives and um, saw some fruit of it. But um, the, what I would like to encourage people to do is not only share this, but to take time for now for you, if you don't already know what your name is and where it came from and like what, what you're called to do is to really dig in and see, because I think, I really feel like it's going to encourage you and bring some understanding about why we're here in this season right now. You're who you are for you, but also for the land where you are right now or wherever you're supposed to be. You may find out that there needs to be a change in where you're going, um, but it's very, very uh, prominent for now with everything that's going on externally for us to be in our our truth and, our, and to actually know who we are because that seems to be a hot topic where you may hear who do you think you are doing this that this or not doing this that and that where we need to know and and answer our own question who do you think you are and we need to know who we are who's backing us up who we're in covenant with and and you just posted something about the keys and government on the shoulders can you speak into that a little bit without getting too, you know, um, headlining with, you know, being, being whatever. Um, actually, you know, just the, the story of Shechem that we were just, just talking about, you know, one of the reasons Jesus is going there is to a, restore the, um, the kingship to the line of David and, and basically to, to take the government um, because this is what Shechem means. Shechem means shoulder. And the, um, the Hebrew understanding was that the shoulder is the seat of authority, right? So this is where 
um, someone, if they were um, giving someone authority, would put a whole set of keys on someone. You know, they're not keys like we would have. They were great sort of um, metal things that sort of went over your shoulder. And um, so that concept of putting keys upon the shoulder was saying, here, I'm giving you authority. Um, so, you know, we, we have that from Isaiah that basically says, you know, the government was on his shoulder means that basically God has given him the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So when Jesus starts to talk about, you know, the keys of the kingdom, he's actually talking about giving of authority to uh, us as his believers. Yes. Yes. And he's actually... That is a covenant in its own right. That's a name covenant, which he's doing then. And that too involves the land. Um, that particular area, Caesarea Philippi, uh, where he said that, was previously owned by Cleopatra. Wow. Right. And Cleopatra, her name means either keys of the fatherland or... Um, something else keys I've forgotten but the whole idea of keys of the fatherland you can see is basically you know keys of the kingdom he's basically making a pun on that and he's, he's making various puns upon her name and upon the recent history of that land around there and he's healing it so so much in fact that one of the things he says, you know, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There's another pun there. And that is gates was always a pun for um, judges. Hmm. Right? Because judges sat in the gates. Right. And um, hell was Sheol. Right. Which was another name. It was very closely related to the name Saul. So he's basically talking about the judgments of Saul will not prevail against you. Well, about two years after he says this, there's a guy called Saul on his way to Damascus. Mm. He has to go through this area. And this area is so healed that Saul just falls down. Right? His judgments cannot prevail. And so this is what authority is about. Authority is about taking what Jesus gives you. And one of the things that I always say is, look, check your authority, right? Your authority, all authority, sometimes people think that means we can make up our own rules. Right. In fact, what authority means is we have the right to uphold the rules of God. And we have all the power of God behind us to uphold his rules. So if we're upholding his rules, it's fine. Yes. But if we're not, we're in real trouble. And that's sometimes where we go, you know, everything falls apart for us because, in fact, we don't realize that we've crossed some boundary or rather where we're not upholding his rules. So I always go, check your authority. Go to God and say, do I have authority here? And sometimes he'll actually say, no, I've had, you know, times when he said to me, no, you don't have authority here. So my next question is always, so what do I have permission to do? And permission is going to always trump authority. Permission from God to do something means basically you do have his authority, right? You may not have automatically had it, but your, the permission that he gives you will actually override anything else and that the the boundaries of that permission is always the key thing to look at to actually go okay my destiny is about my name you know one of the things that i've really found about names is that people tend to view the world through the lens of their own name mm. right the way we see things is actually sometimes caused by the bias within our own name. This is all about what our family believes, all about what we believe, because our name works like that. And that's how we see things. And it's actually really hard to start to see the world through different eyes. But as you start to look at different things about names, you start to realize, hey, you know, there's a different way of viewing this. 
is a different way of seeing this. And it's just as legitimate. You know, every family on heaven, in heaven and on earth has a name that comes from God. And this, you know, for me is not just, I said at the beginning, you know, my background is mathematics. This is not just true for names, but also for numbers. So I just go, hey, listen, actually saying that's pagan to me is never a legitimate statement. I love it. I, you basically, the answer is that's stolen. All right, that is stolen from God and attributed to somebody else. And that is the very position where our names are. Generally speaking, they are stolen and they've got to be back, be given back. And, you know, I use the example of, of C.S. Lewis and, and the lion. And basically, that's what the whole of that series of books is about. It's really easy to see with people who write fiction what they're struggling with. It's not so easy with other people. But, you know, I, my, my, my sort of shortcut is ask yourself, what dreams you've had going way back all through your life into your childhood that have recurred over and over again. You know, think back to those things. And if you can't remember them, as many people say, I can't remember any of my dreams, ask God to bring them back to your mind. That's so good. That, that basically he will be telling you your whole life long, this is the issue that you need to resolve. And in many cases, you know, you'll be, you'll be looking at nightmares, but this is about God saying to you, this is the issue you need to resolve. I would go, you know, my, my ways of getting around not knowing and the sanitization of generally speaking books is basically look at your dreams and look at your favorite things, particularly favorite stories, you know, um, favorite fiction, favorite movies, all that kind of stuff. They actually, it's your heart saying, I connect with this. Yes. I agree. And like I said, guys, I really strongly encourage you to investigate who you are, what your name means, so you can understand the frequency behind your name, because that is what you're vibrating at. That's your, your vibration. And it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, meaning we are vibrating at a certain frequency. And then so is everything else. So that's why when we go somewhere, we're either going to bring it up or we're going to get sucked and baited into their lower vibe or we're going to hold the vibe or and or maybe bring everyone to an alchemy higher and turn everything mm -hmm. into gold. Um, but it the I I feel that the more we know who we are and why we're here and what we're here, you know, what the reason why that we're here for um, and discovering that, then it makes it easier to make those action steps um, here on the planet and to be in the right place at the right time with the right people um, doing the things that we're called. But when we don't know and we just feel like, you know, confetti thrown up in the air and like we're not sure anything, then it, it's it's really loose and we can get lost and blown away in the wind. But when you have the, that structure of understanding exactly who you are or why you're here, then it doesn't matter when the wind blows, you know, because you're you're standing strong and and knowing who you are. And so, but I'm going to um, put the links in here after um, for these book. I, I can, I'm so excited to read the second one I just got in the mail this week, a couple days ago, actually. But uh, I'm rereading this for a second time, God's Poetry. And of course, it does have the rose in the front, which is interesting <laughs> because, you know, we're swift fire. And then it goes back to that fiery rose again. It was just like, oh, my gosh, yeah. everything is just so funny. Oh. I need I need to tell a, a, a very short story about the second book in that series, which is um, about the armor of God, and uh, I um, so uh, I'd um, I'd chosen a very lovely picture of armor for the front cover, 
and the day before it was supposed to go to the printer um, and the designer was putting everything together um, uh, couldn't find it and oh. um, publisher and I had both agreed that this was a perfect picture and anyway so I asked the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit says I want a daffodil so it's got a daffodil on the front cover and I went to the publisher and the publisher said what and I said I can't explain it to you because I can't explain it to myself but all I can say is I believe that this is what the Holy Spirit is saying right anyways fortunately she agreed to to this deal anyway as it turned out the day after it went to print when you really can't do anything <laughs> it showed up the Lord said to me the reason for the daffodil is this All right the daffodil is is really a narcissus right it's narcissus to zeta it's the rose of sharon rose of sharon sharon right is not simply um the plain in the middle of um israel it is a breastplate what and more than that it's a breastplate of righteousness oh. all right two words are required in Greek to translate one double word in um, Hebrew. All right, and it's got uh, lots of other meanings as well, which I've subsequently discovered. But basically, he said, you know, this Narcissus to Zeta, the Rose of Sharon, right? It's about the Sharon and it's about the fact that, yes, it is the armor. So I'll spoil the second book for you by telling you the answer to what the armor of God is and how you get it right because it was sort of I, I i learned this from the mathematics of medieval poetry which i was into for a while while i was studying various things and the answer to how you get the armor of god is that he gives you his kiss kiss in hebrew to kiss in hebrew is the same as to put on armor and to me that was just the most beautiful 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 imagery that I just went okay um you know I, I my understanding of the armor of God is just so different because of that and looking at how it is about thresholds and about names and how it's all interrelated and, and after a while you just go the web of connections that we have in the world and that is so obvious in the Hebrew language and in the poetry of everything. It's just so absolutely beautiful that, you know, you were talking about words and loving words and you just go, you know, you can't even begin to imagine how deep these words are and how many layers they have and how much they are extraordinary and how much God, how much power is in them. They are the fuse of our destiny. They are the fuser of our identity. And that is that's why, you know, the enemy of our souls wants them because there's so much power in our names. And, yeah, so... Uh, you know if i want to finish there i think that's a good place to do it <laughs> wow i'm in tears i'm just like mm. well um i am very inspired and got a lot out of this and i know everybody else did too and i hope that you guys will continue to research and to follow uh tell us where your website is where people i know you're on facebook i read all of your beautiful mm -hmm. blogs and what have you um you post regular and it's very very deep science she's a mathematician i love code codes all in the field everything's equations i mean but she's taking words and stories and equating it and bringing it mm -hmm. so much life and so many layers to it so Tell us where we can find you so people can continue. Uh, probably the easiest place is Grace Drops with Anne. That's Anne with an E dot com. Awesome. 
And uh, again, I will make sure to put these links up as soon as I get off here. I will make clickable links for everybody to find her website and the books that we talked about. And I just am very, very grateful for your time. I know you're so busy and you have you're having a new book come out. Is that what you said? Yes, just recently it's called Where His Feet Pass. And uh, it's a, it's about Jesus walking different places in Israel and the significance of the path that he takes and has historically who went that path before him and so what he's actually doing there. And so, to recode, basically, huh? Yeah, it's basically... Restore the land. Yeah, look look at what he's doing you know his his it's it's joshua basically you know it's the prophecy of joshua you know god saying you know i'm going to give you every place where your foot is oh down. we are we are called to occupy and to commission hands but this in. is a whole new level what with what jesus does you know it's just where you just go okay i can do the let me ask for the drink of water bit right I'm not up to the let me follow this path and raise somebody from the dead bit. This is the following the path, raising somebody from the dead bit because breaking off a covenant with death is what he's doing. Wow. So, yeah. Well, and this is what this is our inheritance. Greater things yeah. than these. Greater things than yeah. Jesus. So, you know, I encourage you guys to go to her website, get everything that she has, all her resources. And also please do share, like I said, and please go to swiftfire.org. If you can go to swiftfire.org, get on the newsletter. That way you know what other interviews are coming up, no matter what kind of censorship is going on. You can have the real talk. A lot of the things on my website, I don't talk about in these platforms because I can freely discuss some things and post some things there. So please go to swiftfire.org and thank you guys for all hanging out with us tonight and please do share and encourage someone, bring courage to someone, have them watch this and see so they can go identify with where they are and see who they are. So they can be the strongest, sharpest tool in this season right now. And thank you so much, Miss Ann, for everything that you do and all your time here tonight. Thank you, Chanel. All right. Bless you guys. Love you guys.